of an environment as well. Yeah, concrete jungle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the wrong kind of jungle. <laughs> <laughs> People of colour in the UK have, have become urbanised in terms of where we're living. Over 98% of people of colour live in cities in the UK, with just 1.8% uh, uh, in the countryside and rural settings. And when we look at how we're engaging with nature and the natural world, uh, compared to 44% of, of white people, just 26% of us are having regular time in nature. The Great British Empire which once stretched around the globe and ruled 500 million people. By the early 1900s, Britain had the largest empire in history, ruling over a quarter of the world's land mass and human population. In the post-war period, Britain encouraged migration from its Commonwealth to settle in the UK to fill the many jobs where workers were desperately needed. Although many migrants back home utilised the natural world for food, recreation and medicine, a disconnect occurred on arriving in Britain. So with UK minorities mainly urbanised, how did the few minority anglers active enter into the sport? Yes, yes, I, I, identify, I, I identify as a lady today. Is I, yes, I'd love female. I'm sorry. <laughs> how did I first get into fishing? I was six years old and we went on a family holiday to Canada to visit my uncle Jamil and my auntie Selma. We took a little road trip south across Niagara Falls into the state of Maine in America. And the family that we were visiting had a log cabin on this lake. And this bloke hands me a fishing rod and rigged up with it was a, it was a lobworm suspended underneath a bobbin. Very typical American sort of style of fishing. And I caught my first fish. It was a trout. Uh, at the time, it was an absolute monster. But looking back, it's probably no more than half a pound. But it was the biggest fish I've ever caught to this day. Anyway, the next day we went back up to my uncle and auntie's house and we sat around the breakfast table and unaware of the controversy it would cause, I very confidently said, any bacon? My uncle shrieked. Later that day he took me for a drive and we, um, he said to me, Kai, you enjoyed fishing, didn't you? I said, yes, very much. He said, okay, well, how about this? I'll buy you a first fishing rod if you promise to never ask for pork in my household again. And that was the beginning of it. I've been hooked ever since. How I got into fly fishing really was just kind of uh, watching a bit of TV and I saw um, a man by the name of Rex Hunt, an uh, Australian fisherman. And um, yeah, he had a show that came on before school. Uh, and yeah, I thought that looked cool. Uh, I didn't have a, I didn't have a rod, of course. Didn't even know anything about, you know, how to fly fish or any kind of any kind of fishing. So um, one day I was um, in Lidl with my uh, dad, and you know, you got the middle aisle of Lidl was full of rubbish. Uh, there was a fly fishing rod there, and um, yeah, I just asked my dad if he can get it for me. And since then, yeah, got lots of help from a lot of the friendly anglers in uh, Walthamstow. And uh, yeah, you just get your first fish and that's it, you know. My dad's from Nigeria and my mom's from Ukraine. I was born in Ukraine and I, I grew up in Ireland since I was four years old. Yeah, how'd you get into fishing then? Well, uh, it would be my grandfather because from my mom's side, so Ukraine. He, um, he wasn't necessarily a fisherman, but because he was like a farmer, it was just a thing you do, go fishing and, and catch fish to eat. Um, so I went with him whenever I was visiting in Ukraine and uh, yeah, si since then every time he goes fishing I would beg him to, to bring him with me because I, I really, really enjoyed it like when I was younger and it's just something that I kept with me ever since. People of colour, regardless of place, of birth or generation, are underrepresented throughout many outdoor pursuits. In order to understand why and how this disconnect occurred, we have to consider historical and current factors that have caused the noticeable absence of minority engagement in the outdoors. 
There are all sorts of reasons why we might be spending less time in nature from our own direct experience and, and many people sharing that they've felt um, or feared hostility stepping into to more rural and remote areas, having our own personal experience of that, but also messaging within the community that it's uh, not for us. And there's a historical legacy to this that comes from the Windrush generation, um, the first people of colour in, in, in that wave of migration, encountering huge racism in trying to establish their lives in cities. You know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And, and how difficult that is um, when there are larger numbers of people of colour in the city, that the idea of stepping into more remote areas becomes really intimidating. But also there was huge pressures to establish our lives in the UK when we first migrated. Um, finding uh, work, employment, getting the kids into to school and education, that there were survival preoccupations that meant that stepping out or having that leisure time to, to be in nature perhaps wasn't always a luxury that um, our elders had. My name? Where you're from? Well, when you came up. Yeah. Well, my name is Margarita Noel. Born in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. So I mm, migrated to England in 1965. So yeah, for work? What made you come up? Yeah, for training, no training. Yeah. So, where, in Trinidad, where, where are you from? You're from the countryside. What kind yeah. of things did you yeah, do? Yeah, I was born, born in the countryside, in, 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 the, in the village, in a village in the country, actually, the deep south. Mm -hmm. And what was life like? What kind of things did you do? Oh, that's, you know, we, um, well, I left there. I left there when I was eleven. Eh? So my childhood days were spent running in the wilds, you know, in Cocoa Estate, you know, Cocoa Estate, Cocoa Estate, yeah. yeah, running around and playing in the river, jumping off trees, mm -hmm. you know, the usual thing. We had fun. I had fun growing up in the country for a short period. Yeah. So when you came over to the UK, obviously you went to a city. Yeah, what? well, Portsmouth is a Portsmouth, city. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a city. Yeah, yeah, well, hustle and bubble. So. Yeah. That's the side of your life then you that stopped more or less going to countryside and mm. that's it. my life changed then, isn't it? There was no countryside to go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. No no forest to run through. Well actually that's how I started daydreaming. I used to leave we weren't living too far from the sea, so yeah, you, you can actually see the sea from, from our veranda. So yeah. yeah. So we would walk across from, from a house into onto the the, 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 the beach. And sit on the on the on the bank. It was down a slope. So sit on the hill and look at this, look at the sea, or look at the sunset if the sun was setting. But dream about how one day I will go across the ocean to see what's on the other side. Mm -hmm. No, that was my dream. I read a lot, so you know, I mean, reading and daydreaming, you know, made me want to travel. Yes. So nursing was your way to travel then. Yeah, nursing was my way to travel. I tried to get in, in into Trinidad, but it was taking such a long time. Actually, the response was quicker from England, so I I, I grabbed the opportunity to come. So I mean, it was one of the reasons you didn't travel around the UK much. Fear of racism, being different. I mean, the country is obviously a lot different yeah. back then than what it is now. And, and you need, you need, um, well, I had no, <clears throat> had no relatives here. It's just friends and we're all nurses and all working at different times. So you don't want to go anywhere by yourself. Mm -hmm. So you know, when you're on your days off, you just, you just stay, stay put, you know? Well, what would you have been worried about? I'm worried about being, being pick on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because your colour. Yeah, because of my colour, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, what was life like in London then? In London, it was okay. As I said, I was with a the family. They were, they were from Trinidad as well. So it was like being back home. And we, when we went out, we went out in, in a group. It was five of us. Mm -hmm. So we were all together all the time. We, were to party. we go to parties. We go to club, you know. And mm -hmm. then my time with them was only weekends anyway. Only a weekend off maybe Saturday and I have to go back on Sunday. So mm -hmm. the time wasn't long. But I did it quite often to break up the monotony. And then... In Portsmouth, there wasn't any, any West Indian food as such you can get, mm -hmm. you know. There wasn't anything for you to buy. So if you had to have anything uh, to be reminiscent of home, you have to come to London, mm -hmm. you know?
Hi, my name is Vishal. I'm from Mauritius originally. So I've been fishing since uh, I was a little. So obviously growing up in Mauritius, you got sea around you. So obviously you would want to have a crack at a fish in there. So that's how I started. And then I moved to England when I was 18. So came here for university and all that stuff, you know. Um, and um, I've actually not fished for a long time until a few years ago. So, uh, but unfortunately when you come over, you've got priorities. And uh, your priority is to, you know, do well in life. Work, Make, work, work hard, around the clock and that kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately, you don't think about fishing. Uh, it's just that you are too focused on, uh, on, on trying to better your life. Uh, but, you know, just running after work, sometimes it's not the best solution. Yeah, so the, the fishing thing wasn't influenced by anyone in my family. My dad or my brothers never used to fish or nothing like that. It was more just a sort of love of nature, personally, you know, nothing to do with family or, or anything like that. By my primary school, there used to be a part of the canal running next to it. And during the summer, you used to see all the, um, the pike and that, and all the different kind of fish, you know, and just became fascinated with it then and then started off sort of just with a net and an ice cream tub or a bucket, trying to catch whatever. Um, used to catch stickleback in the tump, roach and perch and all sorts. And then, yeah, just as, as things progress and you get older, you're after bigger fishing, different styles of angling. I've done a little bit of um, trout fishing. There used to be a trout farm down in Maidstone. An older guy from Runaway used to take us down there. But yeah, just, just the love of nature and being up close to nature, you know. Whilst the UK is a far more tolerant society than during the Windrush era, racism both overt and subconscious is still an issue minorities have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And with the fishing community being a microcosm of society, anglers of colour do encounter racism in various forms. And even factoring out xenophobia, ignorance or subconscious bias, hypervisibility, the feeling of sticking out like a sore thumb is also felt when stepping into environments where people of colour are generally absent. Well, uh, in here, in the UK, I'm the only one, only Mauritian I know that fishes. Um, I haven't come across another Mauritian person who, who fly fish or do any kind of fishing here. Basically, everywhere I go fishing, I'm the only brown person. I've never come across somebody similar to me. Yeah, well in Ireland it's, it's funny because first of all you, you would never, it's rare enough to see a fisherman but it's even rarer to see a fisherman, a black fisherman. <laughs> so I was, yeah it's safe to say I was, um, anytime I'd walk down the road with my rod and my net or whatever I would get a lot of looks and it was, I, I was fine, I didn't really care but it is rare for someone like me to get into fishing. So in terms of in, in the sport or experiences whilst fishing, I haven't really had anything. I mean, you get certain funny looks. I think just people aren't used to seeing a black guy fishing. You walk into a tackle shop and they look at you like you've got three heads, you know, but yeah, mo most people are, are quite welcoming and, and friendly, you know, um, in life growing up in, in sort of like the late eighties, early nineties, we used to encounter a bit more racism. I don't think it's gone anywhere at all. Um, I just think it's toned down now and, you know, people realise there's more consequences. So I don't tend to come across racism these days, really. I could... Online, but online, you would say. Yeah, yeah, face-to-face -face or at work or anything. It's been a long time since I've encountered racism, luckily. Yeah, yeah, often happens, man. You, you know, you, you think someone's a cool enough person and then you see a post they put up on... Instagram or something and you think, wow, that's not the, the person I encountered, you know, but um, like I say, for some reason, social media gives people confidence to um, show other sides of their personality that they wouldn't be brave enough to show in person. I've been exposed to more racism than I'd like to think about outside of fishing in my life, from things like being called Osama Bin Laden at school, being asked if there's a bomb in my bag and all that kind of ignorance. Um, but when it comes to in fishing, I suppose it's always a little bit more subtle and indirect. Um, 
you sort of pick it up on this this radar that you develop um, through through experiences, I suppose. Things like you're at an AGM and your point of view is not being taken seriously. Um, these are sort of microaggressions that we talk about, you know. Um, things like, say, being asked, being remind, things like being reminded that it's catch and release, as if we don't know, un as if we don't understand angling etiquette in Britain. Um, oh, I've got a bite here. More and more anglers of colour are entering into the sport, and one of the UK's highest profile anglers is British Iranian Ali Hamidi. The mental health benefits of outdoor recreation are scientifically proven and fishing gives many minority individuals a reason to engage in the natural world, both within cities and in rural areas. The barriers that often prevented people of colour from outdoor pursuits in the past are breaking down and whilst there is intolerance in certain sections, this is overshadowed by the overwhelming sense of community and goodwill to be found throughout this wonderful sport. My name's Beth Collier. I'm a nature allied psychotherapist. I help people explore their relationship with the natural world as well as their, their human social relationships. And I teach woodland living skills and run wild in the city. And we offer bushcraft, ecotherapy and a hiking program to people of colour to help them find their sense of place in UK countryside. I grew up in Suffolk in a very rural setting on a small holding on the edge of an area called Breckland and it was the most amazing place uh, for childhood, immersed in, in, in nature, getting to roam the fens and the fields and, and really uh, have this direct relationship with nature, learning about what um, could help me stay out longer. The more I knew about the natural world, the less I had to go home. Yeah, I, I was always aware that um, the idea that some people were disconnected from, from nature and moving into cities, sort of firstly Manchester and then coming into London, just really appreciating what that looked like and, and having conversations with people and really hearing how alien nature was for many people, that it, it was dirty, it was boring, you know, why would I want to go there? And it made me realise there might be something I could offer in terms of um, helping people feel comfortable to step into these spaces, but also a sense of understanding how our ancestors uh, would have engaged with these settings and things that you can do for free with your families. So where do you feel more at home then, Trinidad or over here? Now? Well, I would say over here, really. I'm going to Trinidad in a holiday, on a holiday, and and um, it's okay. But then, of course, most of my life I've been spent here, hasn't it? Because I came here as a teenager, so most of my life I've spent been spent here. So I really assimilate all the things that are going on over here. When I go to Trinidad, I go like. I am home, but I have to readjust to the way things are over there. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more, a lot more um, anglers of colour these days, um, and I hope it continues. There's a lot worse stuff that kids could be doing, you know, from estates and inner city London and whatnot. So it's a good pastime. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think it's, it's definitely a good thing to see a lot more young black anglers coming through the scene. What does fishing give you then for yourself? Just the, the tranquility, man. It just gives me a time to reflect and get away from the hustle and bustle of life. Just come and relax, you know? Um, catching fish is, is exciting, it's exhilarating when you actually got a bite and you, you know, you, you achieve one of your targets or something. But just being here alone, just being here alone, you've got nothing but birds in the background and you're looking at the water, it's so peaceful. And yeah, yeah, I like that, man. Just getting away from it all. What do I get out of fishing? Fishing to me is about escapism. Um, it's about being in nature and watching nature run its course. Um, you can't beat that sense of achievement and the excitement of what lies beneath. But ultimately, as I say, you can't beat that sense of achievement and relief when you finally land that fish as it slips under the net. It's just fantastic. I'm Jed, I'm 36 years old. I've been fishing basically all my life. Uh, I started fly fishing in the last couple of years um, with Wolfhamster Reservoir as being my main local spot to fish. Um, I used to be a course fisherman and fly fishing was always a little bit of a 
that's not for me, that's not the kind of people that I'll be accepted by. Uh, and Walthamstow kind of surprised me by the people who are there. A lot of welcoming faces, uh, a good kind of mixture of people, a lot of like, just working class people who love fly fishing. And that made me feel very welcome. And a mixture of people as well. We have basically London fishing there, which is nice to see, a mixture of faces, a mixture of personalities. Made me feel very welcome and made me feel like comfortable going there by myself and meeting people. It, I made lots of friends there now. So yeah, it's been a positive experience. So how much things have changed since then, now you? Uh, a lot, a lot because uh, I mean, there are, lots, there, there are lots of black people here and I've moved. They don't, they're not just centered in London anymore. They're spread all over the place. So wherever it is to go now, there are, you know, there are things that you can, you can do because you have people like, looking like yourself. Yeah. It's another option. Who says we have to all do music <laughs> or play football? It's another option. You might not get paid, but it's something to do. Rather than hanging around on the streets, doing nothing, you can hang around in a park and do a bit of fishing. Yeah. Enjoy the wildlife, you know what I mean?